sounds like everybody might, or looks as if everybody may be here by now. And um, I just like to say, uh, I, I'm Michelle Raymond. I'm the chair of the program committee of the Heritage Trust, Nova Scotia. And uh, I just wanted to say welcome to everybody and um, hope that you're really going to be, find it very interesting, whether you're in Nova Scotia or elsewhere, uh, to hear something from Steve Schwinghammer, who is a historian at Pier 21 here in Halifax, um, out on the near the end of Point Pleasant. Um, Steve, as I say, is a historian. He's also a cyclist. And uh, not only is he interested in the history of the, what, nearly a million people who came through the gates of, Pier, entered Pier 21 between 928 and 1971, he's also interested in what was here on the site before Pier 21, Canada's immigration facility, was ever built. Um, I hope you're going to find this a very interesting and enlightening talk. And as I say, Steve is not only a historian, but a cyclist, which allows him to travel slowly and carefully over the land that he's going to talk about. Um, if you have any questions, please just put them into, uh, if you could just type them into the chat function. And when Steve is finished, then we'll be able to uh, ask, ask him questions and hope he'll be able to tell us a little bit more about some of what he's going to embark on now. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Steve. Sure, it's it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about histories and historic places at Pier 21. Pier 21 and, and the Canadian Museum of Immigration in it, you know, this is located in Mi'kmaq, which is the land of the Mi'kmaq. Mi'kmaq are the first people of Nova Scotia, and for thousands of years they've lived in Mi'kmaq. This is a territory that encompasses Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, eastern and northern parts of New Brunswick, uh, the Gas Bay Peninsula, um, communities in Newfoundland and in Maine. And the Mi'kmaq have shared this unceded homeland with immigrant communities for, for more than 400 years. Now, all residents of Canada are, are part of a historical and legal relationship between Canada and Indigenous peoples. Now, as a major ocean immigration site in Halifax that ran from 1928 to 1971, Pier 21 opened just as a, a, an important stage in the establishment of those treaty relationships had concluded. Um, the initial planning for the port improvements came just as the last of the treaties covering the Prairie Provinces were, were signed. Uh, and the pier actually opened just a few years after Treaty 11, dealing with the North, was put into place. Now, in that context, Pier 21 was a port of entry for about a million immigrants. Um, but as a historian of immigration to the site, I, I struggle sometimes to see the continued relationship of treaties like these expressed in immigration practices or policies. Instead, you know, we usually see displacement, dispossession of Indigenous peoples, and not much in the way of sustaining or strengthening the relationship around the land or its communities. And, you know, I think this invites us to ask a question, and particularly, you know, as a group together interested in respecting the histories and constructions of place, you know, ask a question of how we might in the present challenge these myths and practices around immigration to include and explore those treaty relationships. Now, to be blunt, that history does not much figure in the official designation of Pier 21 as a National Historic Site. This is an honor that has been reinforced uh, by locating national historic events, uh, their plaques at the pier as well, and making it home to the National Museum I work at, uh, which is also the only national museum that has its place in its name. The, the full title is the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21, which is also the longest name of one of the national museums. Um, there have been Lots of public remembrances of the site, um, you know, beyond these designations. Uh, there was a college rock band where one of the guys picked the name because his grandfather came through. Uh, there was a tavern that operated for many years in, in Ottawa that almost got itself in trademark trouble with the museum um, because of the logo they chose to use. 
Um, but some of us may also remember Pier 21 being included in CBC's Seven Wonders of Canada uh, programs a number of years ago. And, you know, with, with again, this million immigrants that came through the site, mostly within living or familial memory of current generations, there are narratives about the site as a gateway to Canada in communities across the country. And, you know, there's a reasonable chance anywhere in the country, if you speak to a group of people, someone is going to know some part of that story, right, of Pier 21 as this port of entry into the country. Locally, you know, in the Halifax area and a bit beyond, lots of people have visited as school kids. And uh, my history and heritage nerds will have some connection to the site uh, through visits for programming, through events, and, and so on. And in some ways, again, in a group uh, like this, where you know we consider and care about memory and recognition of built and site-specific heritage, all of this it, it can sound like a resounding success, right? Great. But what we have at Pure Twenty One is an overwhelming narrative. There's so much noise from the standard interpretation of the site, dare I say, the key messages, um, that it drowns out uh, many other histories of and at the place. Now, it, you know, I, I can't go any further because uh, as some of you, I'm certain, know or are realizing, I'm totally complicit in this uh, promotion of the standard narrative of the site, right? I work for the museum at the site. I co-wrote a book that chiefly deals with that immigration history of the site. I continue to devote a great deal of my energy day in and day out to promoting this, um, this interpretation uh, of the, the site as an immigration facility. Guilty. Uh, but working so closely with the space for so long, one cannot help but be aware of how many histories are grounded at the place that are really not much explored, uh, let alone you know, celebrated. Um, and so we come to recall you know, one of these key ideas in public history, right? which is what we choose to remember requires a choice about what we forget. And we sort of in a public collective sense have forgotten a lot of interesting histories around Pier 21. Uh, so the places of those neglected histories are our subject tonight. We'll begin from the pier itself. We'll consider the buildings on the pier at Pier 21 and maybe circle a little bit outward through the city, looking for histories that get obscured or again, overwhelmed um, by that dominant storytelling uh, at Pier 21. Now, one history that is not much developed in public mind is the history of the construction of the site itself, which really was a remarkable feat of engineering that resulted in the ocean terminals being designated a historic site by the Canadian Society of Civil Engineers. Now, pardon me for a minute and I will share their plaque. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to borrow from, from their outline a little bit. Uh, they describe the development and the reason for their designation as follows. The wide ranging development included eight kilometers of railway, uh, a 500 meter breakwater, and Piers 20 to 28, with over 1,700 meters of berthing things. Other port-related facilities included passenger and transit buildings, grain elevators, a railway station, and a hotel. There were many notable aspects of construction. The pier construction typically employed stacked precast concrete blocks to provide a draft of 13.7 meters. I mentioned this designation was from civil engineers. I did. Um, the rock cut for the railway up to 20 meters deep provided extensive landfill for both the ocean terminals area to the south uh, and along Bedford Basin uh, to the north. 16 new concrete bridges maintained access all across the new railway. Well, the story of a major Canadian engineering accomplishment is literally underfoot 
when we're at the ocean terminals. The transformation of, of this area of the city and harbor into a major transportation hub with much of the construction too, happening when? Happening during the First World War. And this is another history that uh, gets a little bit subsumed in the noise. It's the, the wartime role for Halifax as a, as a port, it urged, but it also impinged on this construction. Uh, for instance, you know, the contractors, they're working away trying to get this massive thing built out into the harbor and, you know, the piers, the finger piers, the bulkhead passenger landing key, all the area of the ocean terminals. And they'd be asked to divert their cranes to assist in war work, right? Moving and removing heavy guns from ships. Um, and once they had usable shipping berths in place, which was around 1916, so early in the work, these were immediately demanded to be used for wartime ship traffic, which you know, literally ties up the space at the construction site. But also you're talking about a project that built out a quarter mile into the harbor, which is you know, a remarkable scope of work, certainly for the time, it would still be a big project. Um, you know, but this means that the contractor had all sorts of equipment on barges and floating out there, cranes and dredges and cement mixers. There's cool stuff to have a this amazing, uh, massive enclosed diving bell to get the pilings in place. And all this stuff, of course, if you've got war traffic coming in to use the berth, the contractor's got to move it. Um, so between that, and then, of course, a little later in the war, we have the Halifax explosion and the attendant damage to existing harbor, fa harbor facilities. There's a great deal of demand and pressure on moving war essential goods through a site that the contractor is under pressure to build more quickly amid more traffic. Now, the wartime conditions, you know, they're, they're affecting the management and the engineering of the project as we see, but they're also affecting trades and labor in the city. Um, you know, there were controls on wages for the trades at the time, partly to try to promote the stability of, of labor forces for employers and control costs. <laughs> Devaluing their work and putting a fixed wage was definitely not in the interest of workers. Um, but there were employers willing to sign a person to this prescribed wage and then, you know, offer a bonus under the table. So there's a great deal of um, rather cutthroat competition for labor in the city on construction projects at this time. Uh, and this certainly affected the ocean terminals. Uh, most notably, there's a, a, a case in mid-1916 um, where you know, they show up for work in the morning and a recruiter has drawn off more than 60 workers in a single day based on the promise of better pay to go work at another site. And of course, you know, so they're shorthanded, but the people who are left behind, are, you know, Bob just left and the guy who took him said he could get a better paycheck, cross my palm, right? Um, so what workforce they had left was uh, definitely, um, what's the phrase? <laughs> Urging uh, a, an increase in wages. The pressures eventually did drive wages up during wartime. So what do you have out of these two bits for the contractor, right? You have the delays from the shipping traffic and you have these wage pressures. When the contractor came out of this massive project, they're a million dollars behind, mostly on payroll costs. And they, they have to go to the federal government to try to get reimbursed for that, which ultimately doesn't succeed. Um, there's another aspect of the First World War history of the site that uh, we're just beginning to look at, but I, I'd love to talk about it a little bit, but with the, with the caution that, you know, this is very much sort of just, just coming into uh, sort of the, the research we're doing. And that's the use of interned uh, laborers as, as part of um, the wartime labor equation. Um, a small interned workforce was employed at the site under military supervision in 1915. And we know so far that they made the request again in 1916, the Canadian government railways, as it was at the time, inquired about employing internees from Amherst. Um, you're still, you know, we've still got to work out the, the full scope of that work arrangement and so on, but it, it's kind of striking that the foundations of this key immigration site later 
were being created in this way. You know, the Amherst internment camp mainly held German prisoners of war. Um, and their work literally put in place the foundations of the site that would welcome German enemy aliens and prisoners of war in the Second World War. And then, you know, particularly in the decade after that war, tens of thousands of new German immigrants. So there's a, an interesting uh, callback to that First World War history in some of the busiest um, and most complex migrations that Pier 21 saw. But this, the First World War role of the site is, is kind of silenced. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna break from my talk for a second because I mentioned um, Phil. Uh, and of course, uh, the ocean terminals, I mentioned it goes a quarter mile out of the harbor, needed a great deal of fill. And um, the civil engineers talk about drawing fill from the rock cut all through the city um, to get everything they needed to fill. Because when you get to the edge of the, the piers at Pier 21, you're in at a depth of you know, 45 feet. Um, it's a lot of fill going in there. And the contractor also felt it was a great deal of fill. So what did they do? They looked for other places to get fill too. In the First World War, the sandbars between the harbor islands were considered part of the harbor defenses, but the contractor didn't really care that much. And he went out there and started stripping down the harbor defenses uh, to fill uh, the ocean terminals um, as needed and got himself in a little trouble with the Department of Defense for his um, poor choices uh, about putting the harbor at risk. Anyway, um, I mean, it's a, a little aside, but I hope through these little stories, uh, what, what we're beginning to get to, you know, is that it's really unfortunate that the First World War history of this site is a little bit um, set aside in public mind, and it, it really does deserve further public development. Uh, but it has an effect in that the history of Halifax and its harbor in the First World War, absent this, is a little dislocated and a little fragmented. And it makes it very dis difficult for us to, to value or understand historic places in our own city properly if we don't have that um, role uh, prominent and uh, commonly understood. Now this was, I, I mentioned this is a massive construction project and it carries a significant cost, you know, something like $20 million in, in the early 20th century. That's a, that's a fortune, right? Um, but the other cost, uh, is the destruction of some really interesting parts of, of the older city. Uh, you know, the neighborhood of Green Bank suffered tremendously, basically eliminated. Um, businesses that were there, the grounds of the, the old Royal Engineers garrison, um, Freshwater Brook and Steel's Pond and, and more were, were all part of the cost that maybe we don't consider right away when we're talking about Pier 21, this gateway and the ocean terminals. So uh, I like this picture and uh, just to situate it here, um, we're looking uh, in this picture north from within Point Pleasant Park. And if we can imagine looking across here, you know, Pier 21 and the fill is all gonna happen in this area. And Poor Steel's Pond, once a, a, a beautiful landmark for people who might have wanted to go for a, a walk with those who they might have been courting, um, is one of the casualties of the massive redevelopment that happens as you get closer to uh, the finger piers and cold storage in those days and, and now what we would think of as uh, you know, the container area and, and so on. Um, one newspaper writer of the day uh, actually pointed out uh, in lamenting some of the loss uh, that some of Joe Howe's favorite sort of stomping grounds while figuring uh, and, and walking through Point Pleasant were, were going to be lost as, as part of um, this massive construction pro project. And uh, Green Bank, the neighborhood, you know, prior to this uh, had been 
you know, near the water, a waterside, kind of a, an elegant residential area. Uh, and later was really kind of a hard scrabble. Uh, the name moved and was applied to uh, temporary, really, housing um, intended for construction workers and railway workers and so on. Um, and it was uh, a much, much different place, a poor and marginalized place um, that I think it would be fair to say um, you know, drew a certain amount of negative attention from other residents in the South End. Um, and so between these things, we begin to feel that uh, a significant part of the identity of the old city uh, was, was lost. Um, you know, landmarks and, and places of, of sentiment and attachment uh, were part of the cost of building these ocean terminals and putting in place, you know, the area that now we principally remember with Pier 21, but in fact included a great deal more. So when we're when we're there, um, I think it's important, you know, to be be thinking about the things that lie beneath our feet um, at the site, you know, uh, embracing the history of the construction and the remarkable story there, but being aware of the extent of devastation that accompanies a project of that size. So how the foundations and the, the pier got in place is sort of one element, and it's certainly interesting. Um, but again, you know, for, for, um, for the sake of interest in, in history and memory as it's built in place, the, the question of what got built there, um, what has been designated as historic, uh, what else survives now uh, of that construction? This is kind of the, the heart of our conversation, I hope. Um, and it, it's certainly a, a good place to, to concentrate in, in terms of neglected pasts at Pier 21. Now, the designated area of the historic site is pretty limited compared to the full historical activity uh, related to passengers at the site. And what survived, you know, um, into the 1990s when it, it gained status as a National Historic Site. So let's just have a little look at the site. And I do love this picture because this is a shot of a very, very young Pier 21. This is uh, really even before it's old enough to be walking on its own. It's, it's, uh, it's very much a toddler shot. Um, and we can tell that because Shed 20 is not yet built next to it. I love this shot. It's from uh, uh, Nova Scotia archives from the Harry and Rachel Morton phones. And it, it shows, you know, I, I'd say this is probably 1929. There was no date associated with it, but it's before there's much done at all on 20. So it's gotta be 28, 29. Um, this shows us the full extent of the historical operational site. And it'll help us define and understand sort of what was designated in the National Historic Site um, and its commemorative integrity statement, but also it'll give us a quick chance to talk through how immigration worked at Pier 21. Um, and that will set us up for talking about some of these neglected stories that we find through anchors from this construction still existing today. So there's two long sheds in the image. In the foreground, this is the uh, customs annex, uh, customs examination shed. Uh, and then in the background, of course, that's that's Shed 21 proper, which you know now they refer to as Pier 21. And both of these sheds were were part of the historic passenger arrival process at Halifax. Uh, the Waterside Shed it housed the complete ocean immigration facility only on its second floor, and that ran from the north end, sort of this uh, the facing brick wall. Um, it ran all the way down the length of the shed, past the overhead walkway that we see, and to the edge of the brick, which now would, you know, if you came to the museum, that would be the edge of that brick facade that uh, forms the front entrance of the museum. Um, you know, so you've got a, a second story space there only for immigration. It's 528 feet long and 96 feet wide. So it's a good big space. Um, and uh, when passengers came into that side of the, uh, the facility, 
This was really for dealing with people, right? It's the immigration side. So they do their medical, they do their civil examination check. Um, these are kind of quick checks by the time Pier 21 is open because most of the screening had already happened overseas. And by the time someone was arriving, they're basically verifying that they've already had their medical, that they continue to be in good health, that they have their you know, settlement arrangements and their visa for coming to Canada. And the immigration officer is just kind of making sure that the paperwork and details all add up. It's very definitely not, you know, somebody coming off the boat and going, hi, my name is Pavel and I'd like to immigrate to Canada. That, that was not the way that things happened at the shed. Um, so when they finish with that and uh, they've received their as landed immigrants or uh, as was often the case, you have returning Canadians or, um, you know, tourists or people coming on other kinds of visas, students and so on. And, uh, they would pass over the overhead walkway between the buildings uh, and they get their handbags checked right in that little passageway actually. And then in this customs annex, that's where if they had larger baggage, that's where they'd be reunited with it. And they'd wait for the train to go inland. So uh, that's a quick introduction to the historic space. But I mean, for those of us who may be familiar with the area, uh, smokes, it has changed a lot. <laughs> and I'm just gonna, so this is, you know, if, if we look at the two sheds side by side, this is the space between them where the trains called to pick up the immigrants. Um, for the immigration space on the second floor of Pier 21, you know, now, uh, the south half of it was converted for use by the Museum of Immigration. And the northern half has been even more radically transformed by um, the sort of bunker facade there. It shows us where the port campus of Nova Scotia College of Art and Design is. Um, up until 1998, a lot of the interior of the immigration facility remained identifiable. Uh, with the footprint of immigration operations. And this remained true of what were called the immigration quarters where someone could have been detained uh, or held back from traveling inland right up until the 2006, 2007 reuse of the historic site by NASCAB. Uh, I think I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk quickly about the NASCAB reuse because it, it does point us to a, a history of the space that, that is not much acknowledged. Um, putting NASCAB in the space, uh, including a large part of the designated historic site, um, you know, I, I feel conflicted about that. Uh, it, it, it overwrites the historic immigration uh, footprint. Um, but immigration was in that space for 40 years. That's not the entire life of Pier 21, not at all. Um, and in fact, after immigration left, for 20 years, there was the Nova Scotia Nautical Institute in the space, a school. And so, you know, this is the fabrication, it's sort of the trades more uh, campus for Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. Um, there's actually some synergy there in terms of the history, uh, you know, to, to find again a school in the historic space of Pier 21 is not necessarily out of step with a significant part of its historical use. And, you know, if I was weighing significance in a certain way, one might say, well, oh, okay, you've got 40 years of immigration, 20 years of schooling uh, in the historical envelope. So our commemoration might be a third about the, the school use, uh, which mm, the balance is nowhere even close to that. I would be shocked. Um, if many people in the city were all that familiar, unfortunately, with uh, the history of the Nautical Institute or its, its role there. Um, you know, trained mariners for, for two decades, they got their, their trades tickets there um, before it was re relocated under Nova Scotia Community College up to Port Hawkesbury. Um, but it was, it was a significant training institution. Uh, now, uh, moving on from sort of the schooling, uh, across the street from this new facade of, of NASCAN. I, I love that we see the Tom Avino sign there. Um, you know, the, the annex building 
which used to be for customs and baggage and waiting for the trains. You know, it's now changed into a mix of offices. Again, some offices related to the museum, but also artisans and artist studios, uh, shops of different kinds, in, including, you know, you can get lunch. Um, and I promise you that the lunches you can get there now are much more interesting and tastier than probably what you could get in the 1950s in terms of bag lunches and convenience food from the canteens uh, operated under the auspices of, uh, you know, the immigration quarters. Um, the entire interior of that annex building, though, is, is very much uh, overhauled. Uh, even the road between the buildings has been changed with the tracks removed um, and the platforms and canopies gone. And, you know, I, I admit to a certain amount of sentiment about those losses, but they're made and this is the landscape we're, we're left with. But the good news is, you know, we do have these built heritage elements that survive that can anchor for us uh, discussion about a, a few of the neglected histories. Um, now, uh, we were uh, joking in passing earlier about me cycling and I had blogged recently about cycling through this area and one of my favorite built heritage books in it is to the hospital, the immigration hospital, this horrifyingly ugly, unfortunately, brick uh, leftover from the original construction. Well, uh, the construction uh, as it was repaired and survived after the 1944 fire. Um, the Immigration Hospital is not a well-known part of Pier 21's physical plant, uh, but to me, it, it's one of the most interesting pieces of the facility. Um, when most of us think of immigration medical and the demands of medicine at the border, uh, we're, we're inclined to think of public health and communicable disease, especially nowadays, we tend to be sharply aware of the possibility of, uh, you know, pernicious little virus stowaways traveling to our borders. Um, you know, but that's not a new concern, of course. Uh, as early as 1720 uh, in Canada, you had uh, uh, Vaudreuil in, in, in Montreal setting up quarantine regulations that would be pretty recognizable uh, to federal quarantine officers now. Um, and actually, the last time I had the privilege of, of speaking with the Heritage Trust, uh, we talked about the, the quarantine station at Lawler's Island. But this is not that. This is, this is a hospital. And so the question is, you know, why, why, why does this matter, right? And I, I think there are a few answers to that. It signals uh, a few things that I, I think are, are definitely worth remembering and thinking about. And the first, is that Canadian immigration and health officials, they didn't generally exclude people who had treatable conditions. And in fact, they anticipated not only the presence of immigrants with the treatable condition, but they anticipated their role as caring for people in that situation. Now we in the present, and I use we broadly, we, we generally do kind of a poor job negotiating public conversations about population health and personal aspects as it relates to immigrants and immigration. You know, there are tropes floating around about the demands of immigrants, for example, on our social services and health services, which ignore, for instance, that because of the rigorous health screening, screening um, immigrants average one-tenth the health costs of an average Canadian resident. Um, you know, so sort of first of all, you have this, this um, public trope. The second thing is there persists a, a stigma uh, about the foreignness of germs. Uh, Alan Kraut, an American historian, called it um, something that I think we could readily identify as becoming a little more pronounced uh, in the last two years uh, as we you know, see a public environment where casual anti-Asian racism is part of the response to current pandemic. Drawing attention to the many layers and the very thorough medical infrastructure that grew up around and sometimes guided Canadian immigration right back to a century ago and more. Um, this is a material contribution to an unfairly troubled public discourse, I think. And then third, lastly, 
there are just some really great local medical histories associated with that hospital. Um, you know, we, we live in a, a city, Halifax, that, that has, you know, medical school, we've got teaching hospitals, we have other sites uh, linked up to the medical history of the area. Um, you know, this is a place that, that tied into those. So, you know, one of the big uses of this hospital, for example, was uh, postpartum care, you know, um, <laughs> perhaps not surprisingly, uh, by the time, and it, you know, after months and months and months, or maybe a year of preparation, you know, a, a, a mom and family might be getting ready to come to Canada, and she might either not be aware or perhaps be willing to push the clock a little bit on how close she was to delivery uh, as a pregnant woman in order to make sure that their arrival arrangements stayed in order and might give birth on the boat or be very, very close when she arrived. And so, you know, this hospital very commonly was postpartum or um, uh, like uh, care for the mom and for the baby. Um, the actual birth, if they had the ability, they might send that off to a local hospital in case there were significant complications. Um, but yeah, moms and little ones, common, common residents there. Uh, in another um, sort of example of, of the stories that come, came through here. This is certainly an exceptional one. There's a, a history of a little girl with polio who was uh, brought in with her family and her family was admitted, but she was detained. The family decided to carry on inland and the little girl remained in the hospital for the better part of a year uh, more or less under the care of a combination of the nurse and the staff uh, at the immigration quarters and some of the voluntary organizations uh, receiving rehabilitative care uh, in local hospitals until she was ready to be admitted as a landed immigrant and sent on to her family. Now, this is, as I say, kind of an exceptional story, but it tells us a few things. Uh, and certainly goes in a couple of different directions. I mean, right away, it's a family separation at the border, which is, you know, profoundly difficult. Um, but it's also not a family refusal because of the potential healthcare burden of one of the members. Um, but also, this child was resident there for a long time, and she was not the only resident, right? She was cared for in part by a resident nurse. Um, one of the nurses at the site, uh, Florence Waldron, uh, she, her home address was an apartment on the other side of that brick uh, building, uh, looking out actually over George's Island, which, you know, if you've got to live at work, that view would be almost enough to make up for it. Um, you know, she, she lived there for more than a dozen years. So Pier 21, there's a narrative of it as a gateway, right? But it wasn't just that, it was also a community. Um, some of the residents were only there for you know, a few days. Some were there for weeks. Rarely, there were residents who were there for quite a bit longer. And I think, it, again, both in the context of current public conversations about medicine, health, migration, but also more broadly in a city that that has a certain amount of attention to its medical history, uh, I'm a little sad to see this spot neglected. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a, a built heritage anchor for a conversation about the immigration hospital and its place, um, not only as part of a border facility, but as a place that had a relationship with uh, the community of medical practice in the city. So, Right by this last surviving corner of the immigration sheds, there are these two other spaces I talked about, the roadway and the annex building. And these are both linked to histories located at Pier 21. They're maybe not much acknowledged in the public realm. And the first one um, that I, I'd like to talk about here is actually that roadway and, and under it. This is where the tracks for the trains ran. Um, the trains of these sort of sparsely equipped and, and rather rudimentary colonist cars, you know, wooden, wooden seats and pot belly stoves and that kind of thing, carrying immigrants inland to Montreal. And it's not 
where other passengers joined their trains. I, I'm just gonna flip back through the images just to draw your attention to something. So again, I love this shot. Um, so we're looking at the in-between space uh, between the two sheds. But if we follow the walkways, there's another walkway coming up here. And where does that go? It goes to the train station. And who takes that walkway? Passengers who are arriving who aren't immigrants. Um, the quality of transportation inland uh, was certainly uh, differentiated based on status and class. Just as the early building of Pier 21 uh, segregated people who were uh, detained there based on gender, but also on their status as British subjects or not. Um, there's actually a, a spell of time in Canadian immigration policy where essentially to be an immigrant, you were understood to be a third class or steerage ca class passenger. And uh, by extension, a first class or second class traveler would never be received as an immigrant, even if they were as we would understand it, you know, moving from one country to another to take up permanent residence. They were an immigrant, but because of the class of their travel, they would not be subjected to the same inspections. And, and this was true for quite a spell of time uh, through the, the um, late 19th and, and early 20th century, sort of the class-based definition of travel. Um, as the border services professionalized, this, this evaporated, uh, but it, it certainly created a great deal of confusion um, as the shipping services tried to bring themselves in line with what the immigration service wanted for immigrants, for example, being landed in Quebec and not Montreal. Well, if a first class passenger can't be an immigrant, where do we put them? Um, anyway, so this hook in this roadway into these these constructions of of privilege and and power, unsurprisingly, you know, also we're going to come into questions of race and labor and status uh, around those these rail cars with their separations based on class and so on. These are the place of work for a, a small but politically significant group of Black Canadians, including men from the African Nova Scotian community, the porters, right? Now, work as a porter was one of the few socially accepted posts for a black man that intersected with the public world of white Canada. It could be long-term, stable, reasonably paid work, uh, which again, not an easy thing for a black man to find in Halifax in the early 20th century. And a few of these porters, they go on to become um, quite remarkable community leaders. Um, you know, and I, I, I wonder, and some scholars and uh, some authors have expanded on the relationship between their ability to travel and meet with uh, Black communities where the trains took them in the United States as well as across Canada uh, as a vehicle for um, political consciousness and also for sowing the seeds of a common cause, for example, after the Second World War, to address barriers to, to Black immigration to Canada. Porters held a job that existed in this, this liminal space, right? But it was sometimes a pretty sharp knife edge of boundaries. Um, you know, Black porters here at Pier 21, they could be welcoming immigrants aboard trains at border sites, right? not just representing the railway company with their, their profession, but often being an early and symbolic welcome for newly arrived immigrants heading out from this site to new homes in their new country. Uh, and we know from stories that have come to the museum uh, collection that this greeting could make a very strong impression. But in contrast to the position of welcome they were placed in, Black porters themselves uh, and many people of color faced nearly complete barriers to entry into the country as immigrants. Uh, besides, you know, sort of the literal boundaries or borders that they they crossed and, and interacted with, they, they had this kind of... Um, interstitial work where they were not only permitted to be in a public white sphere, but expected to be there. It was part of the railway experience. And within this, they worked in the very most intimate of settings, you know, helping travelers to be comfortable during travel, including making sleeping arrangements. Um, you know, and for the porter, a black man, to cross paths with 
white women in this kind of circumstance in most other settings would have been a fraught encounter. But this was everyday work for the porters. And it speaks to their adaptability and their social dexterity that they could negotiate these encounters like one after another after another, day in and day out in the, in the confines of the train. You know, they worked in one of the few occupations that permitted them in the rail industry with you no know, real pros prospect for promotion against extraordinarily taxing standards for their appearance, for the service they would offer, for the maintenance of their cars, and against an environment of entrenched racism. You know, in their times, uh, the kind of complaint that could lead to their dismissal would be something that would be shrugged off uh, if it was made against a white employee you know, of the same company. Now, just to, to further contextualize this work, you know, the railways, these are important agencies for settlement to Canada. Um, many of us will recall the, the prevalence and the, and the remarkable uh, propaganda that the railways produced for inviting people to come, particularly, you know, in the, in the era of Western settlement. You know, they're advertising, they're recruiting, they're making arrangements for settlers to Canada from all over North America and Europe. But American rail partners in particular, they collaborated with Canadian agents to discourage Black Americans who were deemed in many ways unfitted for entry into Canada. And, you know, the, the railways in the early 1900s, uh, working for the railway, just, just saying that, it was a kind of soft power, right? Uh, the railways had a great deal of influence and, and, um, and their agents and officials used that soft power. Uh, and in that climate, their collaboration with the Canadian immigration authorities to discourage, penalize potential black settlers, this has meaning, this is, this is significant. And it, you know, it's not a matter of recorded government regulation, but um, Cornell Chang has this phrase about the, the American Canadian border and, and how it got hardened up. He, he uh, uses the phrase transnational white solidarity, um, where you know, the prejudice left to cooperative construction of exclusionary racially based practice. So those same Canadian railways, though, they, they use their close relationship with immigration authorities to arrange the entry of black laborers into Canada when it's convenient to their labor interests. They'll petition the, the immigration department right back to bring in, you know, notably experienced porters, but also sometimes waiters for their dining service and so on. Many only temporarily uh, with, you know, real risks in terms of being returned. Uh, and if they were coming as immigrants, if they tried to bring family with them, man, the immigration department could be very, very hard on that. You know, white railway workers, they threatened labor unrest. They appealed directly to the immigration authorities to interfere uh, with black porters being allowed to enter the country. And they even hired their own lawyers from the union to seek deportation of their black colleagues. That's a lot of history to park in that roadway. Um, but it is a place that locates it, right? This is the complex history that we're talking about is home there for the community of African Nova Scotian men who are part of that fraternity of railway porters. This is one of the places that they joined and left from the trains. Um, you know, so as a, in terms of a neglected history, while the history of the porters is, is uh, certainly coming to be better known, uh, I'd love to see it attached to that place. Now, just on the, the other side of the roadway, uh, opposite the remains of the immigration hospital sits the annex building, um, you know, the now called the immigration annex. Um, this is, this is only true in a very general sense because it was not the immigration annex, it was for customs. And of course, working for two different federal departments, the custom guys were rather, uh, rather strong on the distinction. Um, calling it the immigration annex uh, and bypassing the history of customs at the place, uh, it submerges the story of cargo and goods at Pier 21, which is a story that outlasts immigration at the site, even though you know, it was central to the identity of the facility. The ground floor of Pier 21, after all, it, it was devoted to moving stuff, not people, um, with the exception of during the Second World War. Um, but the movement of commercial goods was the entire purpose 
of the massive redevelopment of Halifax's port in the early 20th century. And officers from the Customs Department and the Department of Agriculture and so on who worked out of this annex building, they were much more connected to the position of Halifax port in this coherent web of national commercial transportation, which was the underlying ethos of the terminals, than those working in immigration. And the passenger traffic was, you know, was, uh, <laughs> in the conception of the construction of it, it was an afterthought. So this annex building um, that signals this past in, in commercial traffic and cargo, it's a signpost to a, a much bigger built reminder of this past, which, which survives uh, and remains influential in the present. Um, you know, that, that built history of, of commerce surrounds the annex. I mean, you can't walk down there without having the container trucks pounding by. Um, but all the other cargo sheds, the finger piers, the steady updates to the infrastructure down by the park that, you know, now it's the massive container terminal. All of this, this is the, the main drivers for the site. Uh, and yet, you know, when we talk about the main historical landmark down there, we, we do point generally, I think, to the front door of the museum and, and talk about Pier 21, which is ironic because the front door of the museum was actually never part of the uh, immigration facility at the site. That office bay, uh, the only immigration that took place behind it was uh, a small American team. Anyway, um, the most imposing single indicator of that commercial history, which I argue is sort of much more fundamental to the area, is just up, uh, up the road from the annex building and it's our friend, the Green Elevator, which has this fantastic political history. Um, this is a, a, again, Nova Scotia archives shot um, and it's uh, from um, the Macaulay aerial photographs. Um, nationally, a better port and appropriate grain handling facilities in Halifax would help address this, uh, this national transportation problem of having Canadian goods and products shipped as much as possible via Canadian infrastructure and Canadian ports. And, and you know, this is uh, emphasized right from the start in terms of the concept of how to develop Halifax port. And it's reiterated with increasing vigor into the 1920s as the maritime rights movement gets going and starts touching national politics, right? After the First World War. Uh, maritime rights advocates, they're looking to uh, resolve losses in political representation. There's, you know, sort of questions of financial uh, equity and, and subsidy for, for certain uh, sectors. Uh, and particularly, you know, transportation infrastructure, the question persisting of, you know, the intercolonial railway and the situation of effective commercial transportation in ports, all of these things networking together to secure the place of the maritime provinces as better partners, uh, better compensated in Canadian Confederation. Okay, so you build a granary. Well, there was one member of parliament who talked about the economic case for this uh, grain elevator. And, uh, you know, he says, uh, you know, in order to make $325,000 uh, in profit at Halifax, the railway would have to absorb more than $8 million, $8 million in losses on freight rates, bringing that grain to Tidewater uh, to keep the price competitive. I mean, the economics of that is risible. And um, there's a, a member of parliament, Felix Quinn, conservative. Uh, I'm gonna quote him. He says, uh, the liberal government from 1921 to 25 was, was equally reckless and inconsiderate in its expenditures. And there was probably nothing more glaringly and impudently insulting to the finer sensibilities of an intelligent people than the election eve squandering of a million dollars on a grain elevator for Halifax without the slightest practical effort to justify this enormous expenditure. Either this million dollar million bushel grain elevator was needed to facilitate shipment of grain from the port of Halifax, or it was a mere political sop thrown in the face of the people for election purposes. In any case, if there were the slightest sincerity or business intelligence behind the project, 
arrangements might have been made to supply it with grain, especially as it was completed in the midst of grain shipping season. I get the sense Quinn wasn't a fan. I, I think that's fair. Um, <laughs> there was actually an economic argument in favor of the elevator and it goes like this. Um, so the idea is if you can ship grain as ballast for ships coming into Halifax, then the presence of the grain can draw in extra shipping that this other traffic, right, will bring better returns to the railways overcoming whatever loss might exist from bringing in the grain. It's a balancing act, um, but it wasn't a balancing act on a very good foundation because you know, part of building all these terminals and everything was getting that rail cut in place in the railway going around the peninsula. Great, that's good, except the old grain elevator and the old piers fell into disrepair while waiting to get this stuff up and running. You know, Two million bushels of wheat went through Halifax in 1920, 300 bushels of wheat went through the port in the following two years combined. So talking about bringing in the elevator and, and sort of overcoming this shift, um, I uh, met with its share of skepticism. However, as it turns out, you know, grain went through Pier 21 longer than people did, right? Uh, after the immigration site closed and, and you had that Nova Scotia Nautical Institute, the, the mariners getting their tickets there, they would occasionally break from class and go to the windows and get instruction uh, based on the working of the port right out their window uh, as they were handling grain moving along in the conveyor system that ran above the, um, the spaces of, of piers 20, 21 and, and 22 and 23, not 20, excuse me. Um, to move on again, you know, uh, well, I guess, you know, there's one thing about the elevator, you know, I, there are probably not too many people who look at that elevator and think about the complex history of regional grievance politics in Canada, you know, which is, it's a bit of a thing in our history and our present, but I, I guess I'm a, enough of a history nerd to find that a shame. Um, you know, I, I would love to see that building recognized in its historic context and place uh, as a way of recalling that broader history, not only the economics and the commerce and so on, but also the maritime rights movement and uh, the, the kinds of regional grievance that do agitate our confederation uh, from time to time or continually. Um, moving on from the elevator though, uh, we have this rail cut, right? Uh, another anchoring piece of, of the construction that we find uh, definitely still in our, our present landscape. Um, you know, it cuts around the peninsula from Bedford Basin to the Northwest Arm and uh, at the edge of Point Pleasant Park to reach the docks and, and creating that rail service, man, it annoyed a lot of people. Uh, actually, one of the longest running lawsuits was the sisters at Mount St. Vincent who were so annoyed at having their front lawn screwed up uh, they had the federal government in court for you know a solid decade, basically looking to be compensated almost the entire value of you know the, the women's college then, um, because of the the way that the railway impinged on their the the waterfront property that they held, they did get some compensation. They did not get what they were looking for, um, but you know it, it's kind of emblematic. Um, you know, between that and um, frankly, a, a lot of annoyed and very privileged landowners in the South End, um, the expropriation attracted quite a bit of legal interest uh, over several years. Um, it was uh, it was dangerous work creating the cut. Two workers perished. Uh, along the way, and the blasting was sufficiently alarming. The city had to update its, its explosives bylaws, and there was all sorts of complaints about you know damage and endangerment from all the debris flying around. Um, but what's interesting to me, you know, is is the bridges associated with it. These still reach out a century later. Uh, some of you may recall uh, a couple of years ago, Quinpool uh, suffering quite badly when the, the the bridge over the cut had to be updated. Well. That was modern day traffic disruptions brought to us by the construction of 
the ocean terminals and the piers. Um, but it, the construction at this site, it, it doesn't just disrupt our traffic flow in the present. Um, one of the most fiery and persistent public historical debates in the city uh, of recent memory uh, is a direct consequence of the building of passenger accommodation at Pier 21 and the associated railway station and its hotel and the park in front of it. Um, Peace and Friendship Park, uh, or as it was called Cornwallis Park, and it had this associated statue that was intended to be Cornwallis, but was not. Uh, it, this was a construction of the Canadian National Railway, the builder of the ocean terminals. And we've had a, a lot of heat um, in the city over the past few years about this statue and park. In the context of this idea of public support for a city founder, but you know when it was put in place, the city and the public couldn't be bothered to fund it. Um, you know, 75% or more of it came forward essentially as a corporate vanity project of Canadian National Way Railway in support of their hotel and really intended to market CN as an imperial projector, right, to desirable British customers. And, you know, I, I wonder how our conversations would shift around this if we took in mind that, that factual reminder that we're dealing with a corporate art piece that, that actually didn't even depict Cornwallis, you know. Um, but again, this is a, a history of the construction of the site that, uh, you know, I, I feel is perhaps not best known. And uh, it certainly has a place in public conversation. The last thing I'd like to talk about tonight, uh, I think, is, is the fact that this dominant narrative, Pier 21 as a gateway, has actually displaced a more significant history of an immigration site along the Halifax waterfront. Um, you know, I, I had the privilege recently to discuss this um, before the Royal Nova Scotia Historical Society, which is the, the history of Pier 2. And I, I don't want to rehash that talk very much. Uh, but I would like to point out, you know, Pier, 20, Pier 21 versus Pier 2. Pier 2 was the point of entry into Halifax during the peak years of Canadian immigration prior to the First World War. The Immigration Department itself, um, with some internal reporting, made an estimate that twice as many immigrants entered Pier 2 as Pier 21. Um, I would say the statistics remain to be sorted out, but it certainly looks like Pier 2 was, was significantly busier. And further, Pier 2 was the principal embarkation point for the Canadian military during the First World War. You know, one would think based on, on these factors that there would be some awareness of the site in public memory in our landscape of commemorations and monuments in the city, but, but, but we don't, you know. Um, the monuments that are proper to that site are scattered literally the length of the waterfront from you know, the Last Steps Monument near the Maritime Museum, which is making reference really principally to the embarkation at Pier 2, uh, through to you know, the first wave Ukrainian migration monument, which is uh, down in the corner of Peace and Friendship Park, or the Home Child Monument we find at the Halifax Seaport. These are histories that are commemorated out of place. And so just as the narrative of Pier 21 as this dominant immigration gateway crowds out Pier 2 on the one hand, uh, these physical gestures blur the memory of Pier 2 into kind of a generic acknowledgement of the Port of Halifax. And so just to conclude, you know, Pier 21 enjoys this designation as a national historic site, right? And it, it serves to host the remembrance of a couple of national historic events, uh, the arrival of the war brides and, and the event of post-war immigration, both significant and properly placed there. But many key stories of the site, especially ones that are significant in our city and to our communities, they're not part of the designated and dominant storytelling. You know, as, as people here in the group, uh, you know, we, we cherish history of places and spaces, you know, and one of the most interesting challenges I, I think 
uh, we might have is to bring forward and promote the practice of a, a much more critical public reading of historical sites. Um, you know, I, I hope this brief presentation enriches your experience of, of my specific site at Pier 21 in the ocean terminals. Um, and I hope you'll visit as it is convenient and safe to do so uh, with this in mind. Um, but please, I, I'd also invite you to sort of follow the spirit of the talk uh, and maybe read across the grain of your own favorite historical sites, looking for these neglected and marginalized stories that, that might need a, a little more attention and someone to bring them forward. I'll conclude there with, uh, with my sincere thanks. And uh, our sincere thanks as well, Steve. Um, I, 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 that was absolutely great. And you know, it fitted in much, much more than I would have thought uh, with our, our current theme of looking at the infrastructure of heritage, what it takes to build a heritage and an awareness of heritage in the sense of a built heritage and the texture of the, of the place. Um, one of the things that's really interesting about it too is that, um, you know, because this, this peninsula has been coveted for such a long time as a place of fortification and a settlement and everything, I mean, this peninsula in the middle of a large harbor on the Europe facing coast of North America, it's been the heart of transportation. And you just really interestingly touched on the way that massive transportation projects um, have shaped and replaced and evolved and even become the history of this, uh, of this city and this peninsula. And I, it's, it's really appreciated that, that you talk about this as well. I mean, we have, even at this moment, I thought you were going to say something about the, you know, the very fraught discussions around the Cogswell interchange and so on, and the beginning of a, you know, a, a massive project, which again was perhaps going to isolate um, and even perhaps obliterate the Pier 21 and the, that other complex as well. Um, what, I, I'll just start off with one question that I had, which was that, you know, these are impressive buildings. They're very, very impressive buildings. And you referenced um, the fact that the term immigrant was almost tacitly reserved for people who were considered steerage class passengers, you know, that, uh, you know, that uh, prominent citizens of any country didn't immigrate per se, they simply arrived. Now, I guess a lot of those people would perhaps go through, would go directly to the Hotel Nova Scotian, would they, and board their trains or take their cars? Would that be what would be happening for them? rather than arriving at, at the pier or, oh, maybe I've been lost. Hi, Steve. Oh, my apologies. Of course, <laughs> as soon as you started asking me a question, my, my home computer just completely bailed on me. <laughs> so my apologies to you and, and to the attendees, but uh, I have in fact successfully rejoined, I guess. So okay. as long as you can put up with me on, on phone Zoom, I'll be happy sure. to work. Take some questions. <laughs> My apologies. No, no. Listen, one thing I was wondering, I just, while we were waiting for, for any other questions, um, would it be, would people who did not come through the immigration sheds, would they tend to go directly to the hotel? Is that the idea? Or were they sort of yeah. a pair? Were they so, a pair thing? so if you had, um, you know, returning Canadians or, or something like that uh, coming uh, off the ship, and into, uh, into Pier 21, they would go through immigration screening to verify their status. Just like if you arrive now as a returning Canadian, you still have to you know, show your passport or whatever the case is. But once your status was, was set up, um, it's, you know, the majority would have continued walking, <laughs> uh, leaving the annex building and going up. I pointed out that other walkway uh, they would go up that other covered walkway and get to the train station and uh, join a train there. Okay. See, yeah. one qu the another question is too. So, I mean, this is, as I say, this is a really impl impressive complex. And um, was there sort of attention given to the architectural design and making it an oh, impressive yeah. gateway, or it just happened? Do we know who designed it or anything? So, so it, it it's an interesting complex. Um, 
I'm so mad my computer crashed right now. Um, because the actual concept for it, um, and when you look at the initial architectural drawings, um, the, the way it comes forward, it, it, the, the idea in sort of locating this massive transportation hub, there's, there's sort of four possibilities that they consider early on. So you have them considering the South End Ocean Terminals, which is where they're built. You have them thinking about um, possibly building and expanding in the area of Pier 2, which is where the fleet maintenance shed is and sort of, you know, at the southern edge of the, the, the naval base uh, mm -hmm. along Halifax Harbor now, just up from the casino, like really redeveloping that area. And then you get two possibilities on the Dartmouth side, um, Tufts Cove and Dartmouth uh, Cove, basically sort of not far from each other. Um, and they considered all four of those and arrived at they, they called the South End site the George's Island site, uh, since it was mm. right across from it, as um, the site they preferred uh, for serving sort of the maximum number of vessels and, and uh, they felt they could do the best um, integration sort of with a union station with the railway there. But the initial architecture, uh, there's this fantastic postcard um, in the Nova Scotia Archives collection uh, which um, it shows sort of one of the architectural concepts for it. And it's not, you know, these pitched roof cargo sheds like these buildings are. It's a gorgeous, you know, enormous grand station with glass arched windows. And, you know, there's a tower looking over it. And, you know, I wish they had built it because I have an office somewhere in that tower. I want it. Um, but what happened, uh, you know, they, they sort of built the, the foundation, the pier uh, during the First World War uh, and, <laughs> and then the money went away for quite a while. And it, it took um, quite, a, quite a bit of time for the federal government to be reinterested in uh, building this passenger landing area. And in fact, there were a series of questions in parliament uh, during the early 1920s you know, is, is immigration going to move? Is, is anything going to happen there? And the answer was always no. They're, they're going to stay at Pier 2. There was no intention to move them to the, the South End, which is a lie based on the plans, but institutional knowledge was not what it might have been. Um, but what happened when they went to rebuild, you're talking about the aftermath of the First World War. Building materials were not easily found. Um, there was a shortage on construction steel, um, and there was a, a definite press to get things built. What they wound up doing uh, to build Shed 21 and 22 and 23, sort of the, the L shape uh, of those three sheds that got built there, was they poached the, the steel that was intended for cargo sheds uh, at the finger piers further south and just built with that. And so the, you know, these really gorgeous ideas of like, you know, a three-story shed with, you know, immigration and a patio on the roof or, or maybe a big vaulted, you know, a gorgeous union station, like in the style of some of the other major cities, none of that happened. <laughs> you wound up with these cargo sheds. So, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. the architecture and designs along the way, I, I, um, it wound up, it fell to the Canadian National Railway's chief engineer in the area. Um, I forget his exact title, I'm sorry, but he's the regional engineer. Um, uh, Crudge was his last name. I can't remember his first name. Um, but he wound up getting in touch with the immigration department and being like, listen, I built a cargo shed. You can have space on the second floor. What do you want to do with it? Uh, and the immigration department was, was so angry uh, at the idea they would have to move, they just refused to participate for several years. They just like, no, we're not moving. We have a lease on Pier 2. We like Pier 2. We're not leaving. Um, but then, uh, you know, not to be trite, but uh, don't skip meetings. Um, they skipped a couple of meetings in Ottawa about the, the use of um, the, the, the spaces at Pier 2 and at Pier 21, and were basically shoved along uh, into having to move to Pier 21. But they were told that Pier 21 would only be a temporary space. 
So actually, when they so when they built Pier 21, it's only a rebuild of the inside of a cargo shed anyway. But you know, and forgive me, they they brought materials with them from Pier 2, interior partitions. They even brought used toilets from Pier 2 to Pier 21 because they figured they wouldn't be there long. Um, because they were promised a permanent immigration building in the area of now there's a little mission to seafarers shack yeah. and and uh, like the finger piers come in there and there's a little pedestrian uh, underpass uh, under the rail yard. They were promised like a permanent immigration building there. But of course, you know, Pier 21 opens, they start saying, OK, we're, we're here. How about that permanent building? And then it's the Great Depression and nobody's building anything. Right? So they wound up in this temporary shed, uh, as they thought of it, for 43 years. They burned it to ground once, and now it's, you know, a National Historic Site for Immigration mm -hmm. in the site of our Museum of Immigration. I'm like, yeah, uh, it's, it's you know, appropriate, but it's funny. <laughs> it's amazing, too, because I'm just looking at some of the questions that people are asking here that have been, you know, that have been spawned by the conversation. I don't yep. know. This is several theses for you. I'm just answering these well, questions. <laughs> I, I will love to do my best. Um, I would yeah. say, of course, if people are interested in the site, I know we only have limited time tonight, um, but the email address research at peer21.ca will reach me. Uh, please feel free to circulate it among your membership if they attended the talk and would like to reach me uh, in case we don't get to a question tonight. Okay, I, I, let me just read you just really quickly. Um, Dee has been asking about the ships that came through Pier yep. 2 and 21. She mentions yep. that she's a, an, alumnus, uh, an alumna of NASCAD, so that's another aspect of it. Yep. Uh, Isabel is interested in just what are the ways that you would suggest for animating some of the lesser known um, parts of the site. Uh, yeah. Emmanuel has asked Emmanuel. Well, can I can I uh, can uh, I start chunking these out or? I, I'm just thinking there's so many of them right here. Okay. Um, in a minute, but you know we're we're talking. People are asking about the maritime, the marine history, um, about the art history. Emmanuel is talking about the diseconomy of the grain elevators. What the heck led to that adventure there? There's the military <laughs> role of here too. So I mean, as you can see, you've you've opened up many many yeah. issues here. Well, so I, I can give a couple of quick hits in response yeah. to those. So first, um, uh, D, the NASCAD alumna. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so in connection with Pier 2 and Pier 21 and art, uh, of course, my favorite connection uh, is Arthur Lismer, uh, who arrived at Pier 2 as an immigrant himself um, mm -hmm. and came back and was, was sketching during the First World War as a war artist. And of course, there's famous... Mm. Um, his depiction of the, the Olympic at Pier 2 is, is maybe one of the best known uh, Canadian sort of troop images from the First World War. But there's also an astonishing co collection of his sketches, um, pencil sketches. And they're, they're held in a couple places. The Canadian War Museum has some, but also the, the National Gallery. Um, but a, a bunch of, of the material is available online. Um, but you know, in, in terms of um, the connection of uh, in the past of sort of art in these places, there's that. Um, for art and Pier 21 in the future, if I might say, we're bringing in an exhibit on Karsh, who came as a, uh, an Armenian refugee in the 20s. Um, and uh, we'll have a selection of his portrait photography at Pier 21. Uh, I think it, it opens in March. So uh, if you if you like uh, sort of the intersection of the space and, and artwork, we, we have a few things to do there. Um, for the this economy of the elevator and its connection in terms of larger politics, one of the best sources on this is the Royal Commission uh, related to maritime rights, uh, the Duncan inquiry and, and the results from that. And there's extensive evidence, including long commentary from you know, people involved with the Halifax Chamber of Commerce and so on, uh, related to you know, why we need a commercial center in the city. Why isn't Pier 2 good enough? Why should we have passenger traffic? What do we need to worry about in terms of rail transportation and grain movement? Um, and these conversations are laid out. You'll probably have too much of it by the time you go through it. Um, but honestly, sort of the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 
the spirit of the arguments of the day, both in terms of public conversation, but also in terms of um, political understandings of potentially relating the Port of Halifax to what was understood as, you know, the a little bit the last gas of national policy, but the, the national transportation po uh, problem and this idea of retaining sovereignty um, over the movement of goods. Uh, you know, they should move on Canadian soil to a Canadian port, import or export um, as a way of, you know, retaining the, the profit for movement and keeping the interest in its movement Canadian. Um, and those ideas, I think, are, are uh, neatly articulated and summarized in that inquiry. There's a great deal more in the newspapers of the day, and there's, you know, pamphlets and books and so on and so forth. But honestly, like, that's a, that's a one-stop shop for a number of perspectives. Um, the third question, I'm sorry, uh, I have already forgotten. No, well, uh, the questions about the movement of naval, uh, naval forces, of course, that's more peer two. Um, naval forces, like sorry. actually Royal Canadian I'm Navy. sorry, soldiers, I'm sorry. Soldiers oh, okay. embarking and disembarking, it's more peer two, was it? I'm not sure. Well, no, peer two in the first world war and peer 21 in the second. Ocean terminal, yep, world war yeah. two. Yeah. Yes, that was that yeah. was what I was getting at that the the um, use by troops departing and arriving um, at Pier Twenty One in Second World War is another aspect of the. Yeah, I mean, so the military history is is not what I would consider a neglected uh, aspect of the the stories of the site. Like, it, you know, it's part of the displays of the museum. I, I don't know how many media hits I did on Remembrance Day about it. Um, it's a chapter in the recent book the museum promoted. Um, you know, there's, uh, so it's not left behind like some of the other histories. Um, however, uh, you know, if we're interested in that, the museum collections have, you know, hundreds of stories from veterans, uh, as well as their war brides uh, arriving later. Um, you know, so there's a, a good extent of material on the museum website. Um, I have a, a blog on the military history of the site on the, uh, the Pier 21 website that should function as a bit of an introduction. Uh, and then, you know, if you really want to get down into the weeds, you can go everywhere from, you know, the, the more official histories of units managing movements right down to, um, you know, every individual movement of soldiers is, it exists on microfilm through Library and Archives Canada. Some of it is digitized and you can, you know, if you feel inclined, go through the several hundred reels uh, and identify any movement you want uh, with all the people. Yeah. Listen, this I, I there's obviously just so much, and it, there's I, a lot going on at that site, man. That's why it's fun. <laughs> and also the repository of just the intersection of all these different histories and the fact that there's it is in fact a gateway to all these different histories. Obviously, the holdings you have. So yeah. listen, I'm going to say thank you very, very, very much here again. And uh, we sometimes dissolve into virtual tea and cookies at this point. So if oh. anybody wants to stick around, <laughs> and if you can bear to answer any more questions, then. Well, no, I, I'd be happy to take a few more yeah. questions. Yeah. And, yeah. But also our, you know, your, if you want to send on your, your contact information or we'll have contact information. I mean, I know you're not hard to find. If anybody has no, I, you'll you'll have my email, of course, from coordinating this, and then you know, please do share. Um, <laughs> oddly, they pay me to answer those questions, and I'm also happy to do it. So, you know, <laughs> Great. put me to work, gang.